Room 4 Fresh out of nursing school, I got my first real job in a fairly large hospital in a department that I honestly never thought I would ever work in. It was a six-bed cardiac ICU, with rooms that overlooked the city capitol building. It was a very nice unit, and I started out working 12-hour night shifts. The hospital I worked at had four other ICUs that were always full, so my unit always ended up being code bed, meaning if someone was arrested or went downhill fast, somewhere around the hospital, they came to us. I had been working there for a year, and I was no stranger to death. Each patient of mine who had died on my shift was usually already on their way out. Their families were by their side, the DNR order was signed, the funeral home was already picked out. It was rarely ever a surprise. In fact, the only time I was ever needed to do CPR on my shift, it was not even in my department. So I went on a nice long two-week vacation, got engaged, and had a beautiful tan. On my first night back, I received a report from the day charged nurse. She said she was off for a few days and suggested to remind the next day charged nurse that the priest was coming in the morning to bless room four. I thought she was kidding at first, but she was serious. Apparently, while I was on vacation, every patient who was admitted to that room had died. But this came as no shock to me. People died often in our department, and it being a very religious institution, having a chaplain for almost every department, I just shook it off. Then she said that room four was empty and that it would serve as code bed for the night. Around 2 a.m., I got a call saying that they have someone to fill our open bed. The ICU downstairs was now going to be code bed, so we were getting your run-of-the-mill chest pain, take a look in the morning kind of patient. Nothing to get excited about. We get the patient admitted and all settled in room four. He was a gentleman about fifty or so years old, very pleasant. His wife was with him, and she looked dead on her feet. I got her some warm blankets and took her to our waiting room that had cots so she could get some rest. Around 3.30, I was watching monitors and the cameras in each room. All the patients were fast asleep. The cameras all cycled through about three seconds each on one small TV we had on the desk. Room 1 was fine, room 2 was fine, room 3 was fine, room 4, there was someone in there. It cycled too quickly for me to get a good look, and the doors to the unit were locked. Maybe the other nurse let his wife back in. I walked down the hall and glanced inside. There was nobody. I shrugged it off. It was late, I was tired. I was probably just seeing things. I went back to the desk and continued watching the screen. Room 1, room 2, room 3, room 4. I was not imagining anything. There was someone in room 4. The person was standing in the corner by the window, their figure completely draped in shadow. I could not move my body. It cycled through again. This time it was closer to the patient's bed, by maybe two or three feet. The hair stood straight up on my neck. The next time it cycled through, it was even closer. It stood in the light coming from the hallway, but despite the light, it was still shrouded in darkness. It cycled through again, and it was right next to the bed. My heart started pounding, and I could barely squeak to the nurse on the other end of the desk. As soon as my words formed and I was able to make some kind of noise to get her attention, the alarm on the monitor went off, signaling that the patient had cardiac arrested. The overhead system came on. A cart is needed in CCU room 4. People poured into the department. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, respiratory therapists. They all rushed into the room, but I couldn't move. It cycled through the rooms again. Room 4 came up, and this time the lights were on and there were 10 to 15 people surrounding the bed, doing CPR and slamming meds into his floor. Someone went to get his wife from the waiting room. But there it was, in the opposite corner again, a dark figure watching this scene play out. Just standing there. The man died of a heart attack. Room 4 was blessed that morning, right on schedule, and I put in my two weeks notice. The Servant I went to a small college for women tucked away in a quaint New England town. In my second year, I was lucky to get a spot in one of the oldest dorms on campus a stone building that students called the castle, covered in gargoyles and ivy and twisting turrets. 
It was built in the early 1800s. The rooms themselves had been modernized, but it still felt like living in a gothic fever dream. As a 19-year-old romantic, I absolutely loved it. I was surprised to get a room in the castle. When it was my turn to pick, and I saw that room available, I thought I had really lucked out. It was the smallest room in the building, but I still grabbed it without hesitating. I moved in the following September, and things were going great, at first. I loved my classes, and I had made good friends in my first year. But within a few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that my life was on a downward spiral. Sometimes I sat in my room and just cried for no reason. I thought about how hopeless my life was, that I was never going to make anything of myself. Part of me knew that none of this made any sense. I was a straight-A student at a good college, had family and friends that supported me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was doomed. Whenever I went to class or hung out with friends on campus, I felt better. But every night when I got back to my room, the sadness would eat away at me. Soon I became convinced that my outside life was just distracting me from the true hopelessness of my situation. I began turning down my friends' invitations, just to stay in my room and cry. I skipped class to sleep. I was in so much mental pain, I even started to self-harm by cutting. I had never done this before. It may sound hard to believe, but when I was in this room, there was no way to convince me that my feelings of hopelessness weren't valid. I was doomed. I knew it in the depths of my soul. My friends noticed how bad things had gotten and gently suggested that I should visit counseling services. I refused, until one day, something happened that convinced me to get help. I was sitting on the bed in my dorm room, trying to study. Instead, I couldn't stop crying. The pain inside me was so great, I was tempted to self-harm by cutting, just to make the inner turmoil stop for a moment. I closed my eyes and suddenly, with great clarity, saw a girl sitting on the bed in front of me. She had brown hair that hung to her waist, and she was looking down at something, so I couldn't see her face. Then her eyes shot up toward me. She was crying and snarling all at once, the nastiest face I've ever seen a human make. Her arms were covered in blood. I had an overpowering feeling that she wanted me dead. I opened my eyes and sprung out of bed. A heavy mood hung over the room. The bed was empty, but I could tell she was still there. I had never believed in demons or evil spirits, but this was a feeling of absolute hatred that I can only describe as pure evil. I left my room and went to the RA. Suddenly, I knew that I had to talk about how I'd been feeling. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I told my RA about the depression and hopelessness and self-harm. Talking to someone lifted a weight that I hadn't even realized I was carrying but I didn't mention the ghost girl on my bed. When I stopped talking, I expected the RA to send me straight for counseling, which I did end up doing, eventually. Instead, she asked if I knew about the history of that room. She didn't want to scare me by telling me before, but given what was happening, I had a right to know, way back in the early 1800s, the college had a program for students from low-income families. They could attend the college for free, but they had to work as servants to the richer kids. My room was reserved for students in this program. One year, the girl who lived there was relentlessly bullied by her richer classmates, whom she was forced to serve as a maid. The stress got to be too much, and she flunked out of her classes. When the college asked her to withdraw, she slit her wrists in her dorm room bed, dying by suicide. I stayed with a friend until student life could find me another room. As soon as I left, the depression lifted. And to this day, I'm convinced that if I had stayed, I would not have made it out alive. Beach Town We moved to a small beach town about four years ago, became friends with our neighbors, and enjoyed the more relaxed and slowed down lifestyle that a small beach town offers. Nothing spooky here. The only thing, off, about it was the drug problem in the neighborhood. We'd occasionally see people passed out behind the wheel of their cars. One time, we found a note in our bushes imploring us to Give back my children, I have several young ones. And that she slash he slash they, the writer of the note, was coming back to get them. Weird, and worth a call to the local sheriff's department, 
but that was it. About a year ago, or maybe longer, since I think it was mid-pandemic, my incredibly capable and stout-hearted neighbor, I'll call her Mary, knocked on my door and asked me out to the middle of the street to talk. She then apologized to me and asked if we were all right. Surprised, I said, Yeah, we're okay, why? Mary is a no-nonsense, second-generation German-American, about 65, works all day in her garden, taught for 40 years, and is phased by nothing. She says sorry, because she didn't get to talk to us last night or check on us during all the commotion, and that it wasn't very, neighborly, of her but it was. Just so late and her nerves were frazzled. I told her that nothing happened last night, and that there was nothing to apologize for. That's when I see another neighbor, Ron from a block over, walking up to us. Unbelieving, she says. What? I could have sworn I saw you outside last night during the commotion. Ron, not his real name, now right next to us, says. Dude, how could you not have heard it? Apparently the night before, around 1 a.m., Mary heard a loud booming coming from her front room. Like all the houses on our street that face the coast, hers is dominated by a large picture window that overlooks the hill down towards the water. Thinking it was just sonic booms, or artillery testing, we live next to a military base, rattling the window, she didn't think much of it. However, after a while, Mary said that she thought the booms were getting louder and that they might break the window, so she got up. When she walked from the back bedroom she shares with her husband, who was still asleep, into her front room and turned on the light, the booming on the window stopped. She noticed after turning on the light that her front picture window now seemed to be covered in mud. After looking around for a few seconds, seeing nothing, she turned off the lights and headed back to bed, again, phased by nothing. As soon as the house was dark the booming started again, this time coming from the front door. Inset slightly from the window, the front door has a tall thin window next to it that allows you to see who's in the inset. In the dark, Mary said she peeked through the window and saw movement. Immediately awake, she went back to the bedroom to get her husband. Now Mike, not his real name, is an old school beach bum and firefighter, has seen it all, and has no time for nonsense. So Mike gets up, foregoes getting the guns that Mary says he has, after all this is a nice beach town, and walks with Mary behind him to the front door. Carrying just a tennis racket, Mike turns on all the inside lights, as well as the porch and outside lights. As soon as all the lights are on, Mary screams. All the stuff on the front window that she thought was mud gets lit up. But it's not mud, it's blood. Hundreds of bloody handprints of someone banging on the front window. And now that banging was coming from the front door. Mary tells Mike not to open the fucking door and picks up the phone to call 911. At this point, two things happen. Mike opens the door and the person at the front door starts screaming. Mary says that all she could hear was, and I fucking kid you not. Help me! Help me! They've took my kids and are eating my face. They're eating my face. Through the crack in the chain door, Mike is now looking at a woman, or what he thought was a woman, with long black hair, covered in blood and pounding on the door. Help me! Help me! They've stole my kids and are trying to eat my face, was all this person kept saying. Mary said that there was so much blood on this person that she couldn't tell what he she looked like. And what they at first thought was long dark hair was actually blood pouring in rivulets from their scalp. Here's the kicker. Mary, now on the phone with the sheriff, starts relaying to them what's going on. And this is what the sheriff says back. Ma'am, we're aware of the situation and are handling it. How exactly are you fucking handling this? She says. The 911 operator tells her that the sheriff and deputies are on the street in front of her house and are monitoring the situation. This is when Ron jumps in. Apparently, this truly disturbed person had been going to every house on his block, and our block, pounding on the windows and doors while screaming the same thing. Basically, that someone stole their children and was trying to eat their face, while the fucking cops followed them from a distance. They had hit at least ten houses with the same shit. For some reason, the sheriffs decide to take the person into custody right before they reach our house. I have several young kids, 
as well as a large old picture window that surely would have broken after a few good slaps. That morning, Mary shows Ron and I her front door and window. So much blood. There was never any follow-up from the sheriffs as to who the bloody person was or what eventually happened to them. The only thing we ever heard was that it was someone known to them, and that drugs were involved. Thanks for watching. Subscribe and stay tuned for another episode tomorrow.